Hi, this is Michel Dargent from La Corbière, Sensé, France, and you are listening to Cider Chat. Episode 122. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Rio Wincoller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. This week, we are on the back roads of Normandy, and the featured guest on this week's episode is a cider enthusiast, a local who lives in Normandy. His name is Michel, and he brought us into this here episode. I'll be telling you more in a moment about our meetup. But in the meanwhile, let's catch up with a bit of news out and about in Ciderville. Well, I did it. I was finally able to get to Nine Pin Cider this past weekend. It is based in Albany, New York. Albany happens to be the capital of New York State. And the Hudson River flanks Albany to the east. Nine Pin Cider is a couple blocks up from the river on a really fun street, and they have a nice tasting room. It opens to the outdoors. There's lots of seating at two different levels. Very nice group of gals were bartending, pouring flights of four, uh, modern ciders, all modern ciders on tap for seven bucks, and I had a delightful time there. So if you're in Albany, check out Nine Pin Ciders. Uh, You might recall me talking about their Gathering of Ciders, which takes place every February. So next year, I do hope to be there. Again, that's Nine Pin Ciders in Albany, New York. Check it out if you're in town. Last week's episode was with Marcus Robert of Titan Cider Works in Yakima, Washington. That was all on Keeved Perry and what they're doing, Growing Perry Pears. Very informative podcast. Then on Friday, I followed up with a blog post on a new cidery startup in my neck of Ciderville, and that's in Turner's Falls, Massachusetts, where both April Woodard and Kurt Shear have taken over an 1880 mill building that was kind of, you know, the town was looking for a buyer to take this on because it's a big project. But having gone inside this building, I could see the total attraction because, oh, it just screams, put barrels of cider down in the basement. I mean, this place is massive. And you go down in the bottom area and there's these giant, I mean, giant rock walls that they built in the 1880s because on one side there's Connecticut, it's all kind of bedrock. And the other side is a Turner's Falls Canal. It's the ambient temperature is perfect for slow fermentation. The upstairs area is going to be like their event space and cider bar. It has these curved arch arches inside, all like brickwork. If you want to see a video of that area, go to the Cider Chat YouTube channel. Or you could just go to the blog post and you'll get that link there too. Ciderchat.com forward slash wild child sellers. If you'd like to hear Kurt's backstory, go to episode 20. That's Kurt Shear of Millstone Cellars in Maryland. And then just to kind of stretch out a little bit of like the cider lineage going on here, Shear should be an interesting last name to kind of just put in your pocket too because there's Sarah and Kyle Shear who are brother and sister, right? Pop is Kurt Shear, and they've taken on craft cider that's based in the Hudson Valley. And they're really known for kind of like their sour style cidre uh, ciders. So a lot of stuff happening, really, really exciting news for Turner's Falls and for April, who's wanted a cidery forever. So I'm really stoked about that. And what a a sweet little uh, something to look forward to coming to Cider Days up in November.
On this little segment here, we're going to need a little bit of help from Mr. Quince because there was a message directed to you, Mr. Quince. Uh, that was pretty cool to get that message from Adam in New Zealand. <clears throat> yes, indeed it was. Uh, hello, Adam, and thank you for writing. Yeah, Adam wrote, he had a couple questions about a uh, uh, the quince tree he found one in the vineyard where he works and this year it has a number of quinces on it he had showed just some beautiful photos <clears throat> yes i thought they were lovely quinces yeah so uh he was asking what is the best way to know when a quince is ripe i don't want to go ahead and remove one to test the sugars or ta or ph as there are not that many also i'd like to make quince cider the same as apple cider? He has, has kind of a question mark there it, asking if you make it the same way. And then finished with, cheers, Mr. Quince. I love the podcast and have been listening for a long time. <laughs> that was very kind of you, Adam. I, I am tickled as much as a quince could be tickled. Uh, let, me, let me answer that question if I can, Rhea. Well, by all means, Mr. Quince. Never tug a quince. Never tug medlars either. And Rhea, don't you think that Adam would like to know that you shouldn't tug on peri pears? <coughs> Excuse me, I think this question was for me. That's right, Palms. Now let's give Mr. Quince a chance. But we will make a note here for Adam and all the folks out there in Ciderville that Palms do not like being tugged. Are we in agreement on that? Yes. Yeah, but I really think that he might want to know a little bit more about peri pears. <coughs> Oh, these bears. Okay, Perry Pear, we got it. We'll save that for another l later date right now. Would you please continue, Mr. Quince? Thank you, Rhea. What you want to do, Adam, is cradle the quince in the palm of your hand and gently lift. If you feel a snap, the quince is ready. If not, let the quince continue to ripen and stay on the tree. That's right, Mr. Quince, and that's true for all palms. If they lift and snap off easily, you're good to go. Otherwise, let it stay on the tree to continue ripening. Now, the thing with palms that I know, especially a quince, is that it's aromatic to the cider. So it's not like an apple or pear that you can kind of crush and then press to get a lot of juice out of. It's not like that at all. The A quince uh, will be crushed and often put in a muslin bag and then seeped into the cider for aromatics, as far as I know. Um, so if anyone else has more info on that who has worked with quinces, please send that our way. Is that about right, Mr. Quince? Roger that, Rhea. And thank you very much, Adam, again for writing. And please let the quinces know that we here in, if I may say, Quinceville, are rooting them on. All right. Well, that was awesome. Thanks again, Adam, for writing. Good luck. Let us know how it goes. The glass goes to the folks who are all patrons of Cider Chat. We have just regular folks who enjoy making cider and drinking cider. And then we also have commercial cider makers. So you could join at all these different levels of tiers, if you will. Either way, it's a fun community of people. And some of the commercial makers that I want to thank specifically is a Current Cider of Percocet, Pennsylvania. They almost have their tasting room opening in Fishtown, Philadelphia. I cannot wait to go to that. Then there's also Big Fish Cider Company, which will be coming up on a upcoming episode of Cider Chat. And also Ross on Why. 
a fantastic cidery based in Ross on Wye in the Herefordshire area of the UK. So if you're touring about there, definitely get a bottle of Ross and Wye. Or if you're out in Europe and other spots, grab it, grab it, and bring it home. And chug a couple bottles on the way. <laughs> so you can become a patron too. Just go to Patreon forward slash Cider Chat. Or you can find that info via a link at the website for this here podcast. While I was setting up and editing, all of a sudden, boom, across my screen came a little email notification saying, hey, somebody just signed up for the Totally Cider Tour to Normandy. Oh, man, oh, man, we, we meet up in Paris, and we return to Paris, and we travel about to Pédoge and a little bit south of Pédoge and Donfront. These are like two regions of Normandy. We're going to go to makers that I have met before. Go to totallycider.com. It's a page at Cider Chat. Get the details there. You could see the presentation, see what it includes. There's so much that includes. And we're going to be there for seven nights. It includes all the breakfasts, all the lunch. There's cider dinners happening. We go to Mont Saint Michel. We get really kind of like behind the scene tours. We're going to be meeting makers that don't normally open up their doors. Um, and we're going to be seeing some very famous makers, of course, Eric Bordelais, who rarely wants to welcome groups because he gets so overwhelmed. So that's going to be special because we're going to get to hang out with him. And then we're going to have a cider dinner with him at night with his, with his friend who is a chef at his restaurant and hotel. Uh, so it should be amazing. And just having gone to that hotel and looking at the Calvados in the cabinet, the range of Calvados is, is insane. Whew, uh, I, I kind of get like prickles when I think about it because I've really, you know, in this uncharacteristic way, I fell in love with France. I never really thought I was kind of going to go there in a way, but now I've just fallen in love with it and I'm learning the French language and really getting enmeshed and excited to bring this to everyone out there in Ciderville. If you have not signed up for this trip, please do. People are sending in their deposits by the end of April. After April 30th, it will be a different kind of deposit scene. So now's the time to get in, secure your space, because I have a feeling there is going to be a rather large waiting list for this trip, because it's, it's epic. I mean, people are not doing cider tours in Normandy like this. And it takes a lot of work to find some of these producers. It took me two trips over there to really get some of the behind-the-scenes scoop, which leads us to this week's chat with Michel. He will talk a little bit about his history in that area. And we're stepping out of the box here. So let me bring you back to that in just a moment. Take a little pause. Uh, while we're taking this pause, get out your pen or, or stop your phone if you're listening right now and make a note on your calendar to check out the Totally Cider Tour to Normandy because you do not want to miss this. You're going to be seeing it on social media while we're there and realizing, dang, oh, I just missed an opportunity of a lifetime. And for some of you commercial makers who have yet not signed up, think about collaboration. You're going to be meeting some amazing people that have not been touched upon in this way. So, yeah, totallycider.com. Check it out. I met Michel d'Argent while staying at his home in the Donfront region of France. I was traveling about doing research for the upcoming Normandy trip, 
and he had reviews there that said this guy likes cider and wouldn't you know it as soon as I walked in the door we sat down started talking a mile a minute and he started bringing out the pore and cider and what I really enjoyed about getting to know this guy and his dog Jaco was his affection for cider and pore and he had an understanding he had tried all the producers and selected one, one that we will actually be visiting on the Totally Cider Tour. And you're going to get a little bit of a sneak peek on that after we're done speaking with Michelle. What I really appreciated was his insight on the region and all the producers because he had gone to everyone and tried all of their ciders and pore and cavados, the whole nine yards. And he had settled on this one producer that again we will be visiting and that evening when we had dinner we served blood sausage made at the farm where the pore that it was cooked in was also made and that wasn't it, the end of it then he served chicken that was basted in cedar from that same farm can't get much more local than that and talk about terroir it's just just thinking about that meal now just kind of makes me drop to my knees because it was exactly what you want to experience when going to Normandy. Getting to know people like this and having that full service foodie experience and tasting the pairing of cider and perry in that way. So we're going to begin on this little quest with Michel and talk about just the home that he's living in. So grab that glass and make sure it's full because we're hanging out with Michel d'Argent in Cesse, France. This home that we're in, how old is this? And this is an oak. Oh, that's, that's an oak beam. Old, very, very, very old. Those are big beams. Those are, that's a big tree. Five centuries. Five centuries, 500 years it's old. Wow. The house is five centuries old. Wow, so that's yeah that this heart place, yeah. is about five centuries years. Yeah. Wow. Do you know the history of this place? N not exactly. <laughs> Just wow. uh, it was the the the, <clears throat> the period the English period. Right, the, when uh, it, England it, came and kind of conquered yes. here, yeah. Mm. But that changed, yeah. so no <laughs> more. <laughs> we all have to get along. Yeah. That's the main thing. We all have to get along. Now, Ciderville, your ear's going to be kind of stretching as you're listening to Michel because he is, you know, essentially translating constantly in his head as he's speaking to me. So thus, the delays. This is a very astute gentleman, so do not be mistaken on that at all. So I really want to tip my glass towards him and bow bow deeply uh, to his working around the conversation with me because what's very interesting that I learned is that I do not have an English accent being American and the French from what I had found were more tuned to the English accent from the UK versus the American and that's because uh, in some of these places that I was, there weren't that many Americans. Go figure. So we'll, let's go right back to this as we continue to explore a little bit about his family history in coming to France. My family came in France at the end of the 15th century from Hainaut. Hainaut is um, Be Be Belgique. Be Belgium? Belgium. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yes. Look. Mm -hmm. But Belgium and France was the same. Right, uh, right, they were, yeah. My family came uh, in, in in France uh, at the end of the uh, 15th century. Wow. So your family isn't originally from the Domfront area? Or no, I, I am not original no, yeah, from right, this right. region. No, but why no, not live here no. when the pore is so good? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, champagne's one thing, but let's face it. It, it, it's not the same. Place. It's not the same. Oh, it's not the same. That's true. 
a lot of homes were destroyed and a lot of towns were um, destroyed during World War II. Yes, but uh, not around here. There, there, there are no no uh, big towns in this it's area. area. No. So they avoided that. Or, yeah. Only little towns like Dorf. Yeah. Uh, the, the biggest one uh, in the department is Alonso with uh, 25,000 inhabitants. Mm. Not so big. <laughs> not so big. And not compared to Paris, that's for sure. <laughs> right. Or Caen is, is very... Yes. Well, yeah. What is the biggest town of Massachusetts? <laughs> Boston. Boston. Okay. Boston okay. is a big, big, uh, you know, there's... Boston is in Massachusetts. Yes, it's yes. part of Massachusetts. It's where our capital I, is. I, 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 I believed it was in New England. New England, that's right. Yes. yes it's all part of New England. There's, New England is it's not a state. It's an area. It's uh, an area. Okay. It's uh, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, Connecticut, okay. Rhode Island, okay. Maine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's about five states. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's the first area that the English came to colonize. Boston is a traditional uh, city. It is, yeah. Traditional. has a lot of history. I never went in USA. No? Never? No. no. Yeah. I, I, know, I, I know USA by, by my children. Michelle and I went on talking a little bit more about the U.S., and then he asked me what I would like to have for my aperitif before dinner. Quarter to eight aperitif. Pear or apple? Uh, apple is drier, so mm -hmm. apple is sweeter. You can drink uh, first apple and then uh, pear. Boy, okay. Mm. Okay, well, I'll let you decide as the host. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you're local here, and I'm just going to go with it and be happy. How's that? <laughs> it was time for dinner, and Michelle was cooking, so I took the opportunity to take a walkabout in the neighborhood. I wanted to visit the small herd of Norman cows. That's what they're called, and they're typically white and red, and they always look happy. Actually, they're kind of always frolicking in the field, and go figure, that time of year, well, all the fruit is dropping off the trees, partially fermented, and you know those animals are enjoying a little bit of a sip of their style of perry and cider. And I also took the opportunity, too, because all around the neighborhood were ripe peri pear trees. So I was plucking off the peri pears, and you bite into it, and there is no more amazing experience than having that juice kind of run down your face and realizing that wow this is what a peri pear tastes like it's slightly sweet spicy has a tannins but it's also tasty too not necessarily a full spit out like Gah, i can't eat this more of a mm, this is interesting let me understand what i'm tasting here and that's the best part of visiting normandy you get to know your pears and apples, especially in the fall, which is the perfect time of year to be there. So let's head back while we delve into that aperitive that we're talking about before this break. Cheers, this is the pore. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm gonna have this first. It's just, yes. I wanna... Wow. So this is like a pomu, but with pore. Yes, it's it's not pomu, but near. There are um, other fruits. Other fruit in here? Yeah. Besides the pear? Grapes. Oh. Uh, dried grapes. Dra like raisins? Yes. And, um, so do they uh, put it in a oak barrel too, or a, a barrel to age it for a while? Like Pomu is um, Pomu is only uh, cider right, and Calvados. Right. Uh, and Po only um, Poiré and Calvados. Mm. But these are cider and mm -hmm. Calvados and uh, other fruits. Right. And this one, Poiré and Calvados and other fruits. Right. Totally, totally different. Yep. 
Le Soussean. Le Soussean. Le Soussean. Le Soussean. Is a name uh, of, of the place. Deposite. Okay. Because it is made in Soussean. 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 And le Soussean. Le Soussean. It's, it's, right. it's a, a, a type of fish. Um, okay. Okay. But the actual dream. It's, it's, uh, you, you, you don't find. Uh, um, Anywhere else, Anywhere only else. in that area, yeah. But it, it's it's being called poré, but it's not poré. It's something else. It's a is a poré apéritif. Yes. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Just wondering, yeah, how they label aperitif. Uh, aperitif. Yes. Yep. And this is also from the same place. Is this the one that's right around yes. the corner, three mm -hmm. kilometers from yeah. here? That's a person. Yeah. Oh, he looks like a good mm -hmm. chap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, and look at the press. Yeah. It's like a pneumatic press, isn't it? He does some good production. Yeah. Is he... Well, 10,000 10, liters. 10,000 liters? Yeah, from, of Calvados. Of, of Calvados? Yeah. Wow. I, I don't know how many bottles of cider. And wow. Cider. Did his father do this before him, or is he... He came here and started doing it first himself. Like sometimes it's... Now, I, I think um, this... Yes. It's first himself. First himself. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Today is products finest than before. Oh, I'm sure. Mm. He's been doing it for a long time. Yeah. And are all the trees on his property or does he come out and collect other places? Both. Both, yeah. Mm. Like the trees in your backyard, is anybody... One going to use them or they'll just drop? Does somebody come and pick those pears? Yes. Oh, okay, good. My neighbor. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> uh, come to. Oh, boom, pick them right up. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh -huh. <laughs> I look and I'm like, oh, I hope this doesn't go to waste. <laughs> that was, it was very um, tannic and astringent, but it was also sweet, the juice. It was very nice. Would you prefer? I love the poré. Poré? I do. I prefer the poré. Okay. Even before I sip the poré, I'm getting flavor coming through. Yeah. Right, even before. Mm -hmm. uh, and not so much with the mm -hmm. the um, the apple. But the poré, it's just because the, the pears here are just unbelievable. I. This one is, is a more uh, flat. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe just this year. Maybe yeah. it was the apples that mm -hmm. year that changes, right? But this, the poire, as you're, you get it coming in, and it's just really complex. And that's the pleasure for me coming here because I feel like I'll get to drink enough poire to really begin yeah. to understand it. The pears for making um, poire um, are... A very old sort of pear. It's really uh, of pear is very ancient, and um, we think uh, that the, this sort of pear is the first sort of pear mm. uh, mm. in the world. This sort is an ancient, an, an ancient uh, mm -hmm. sort. Yeah, it's unique. I mean, there's no place in the world like this mm -hmm. with this yeah. type of pears. I know in the UK they have yes. pears. Yes, but they don't make pear. They make perry. They do make perry. They don't. They, it would be pore mm -hmm. in there, but they there are some um, UK cider makers who do make pore. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know uh, uh, English cider, mm -hmm. which is not very good. You don't like it. <laughs> well, why don't why don't you like it? What do you notice about English cider that's different than it's your a, cider? But taste. Uh, yeah, taste. It, the taste isn't agreeable. No. Well, everybody likes what's in their own backyard the mm -hmm. best. I mean, I still want my mother's, you know, bread that she made. Yeah. You know, it's, oh. there's nothing like oh. home. Um, it's interesting because. <clears throat> you know, the, the English have something to say about the French cider and the French have something to say about the English cider. Oh, 
uh, uh, English people like uh, French cider. Oh, absolutely, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And they, they, they said too, like me, that English cider is better mm. than French one. <laughs> well, there you have it. Mm. There you have it. But we think we we say we find. Brit um, Brit um, Brittany uh, cider, French cider mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Brittany, mm -hmm. is not so good uh, than uh, the Norman one. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. What What's the difference there? It's not the, the, the it's under the sort of um, apples, other or? sorts of apple, mm -hmm. other sort of ground. Mm -hmm. Is it sweeter? Do they have a lot of sweeter cider? No. Um, no. It is hard, I think. Hard? Hard, yeah. Hard. Like, uh, what do you mean by hard? Hard, dur. dur. It, it bites you a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Mm. Well, I, <clears throat> I feel I have to go to Brittany before I could talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that will be... It's definitely on my list. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I know I'm on the edge of getting closer to it, but um, there's something so special about this region with the pears, though. It, it, it's, it's like nothing I've ever experienced before. Mm -hmm. I've been in a lot of orchards, and uh, everyone is unique. But to see these giant pear trees... And to walk down this road and hear them dropping, I yeah. feel like I'm in heaven. I, I don't know what it is, but it it just makes me feel so happy for the world yeah. that there's pear trees like that yeah. and people are making these unbelievable drinks. Right about now, we were getting into a conversation. You could kind of hear my hesitation because I wasn't quite sure where Michelle was going. And it was all about the blood sausage. So let's go next to that and delve into the blood sausage, which I later found out was made by basting it in pore. Yes, a, a sausage, a, a, a blood a sausage. Yes. Yes. Do you like it? Um, you have. I have to have it while I'm here, huh? I, I haven't had blood sausage in a long time, um, so I can't say whether... Uh, in, in the menu, you have... Uh, in the menu tonight? Tonight. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, how exciting. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Is this um, something that you bought, or do you... I see that you have a... A um, boar. boar. on the wall. That was a big boar. Yes. How, no, not a, not a very big. 160 pounds. Just 160 pounds. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Are the boars around here? Do you yes. Have... Oh. Too much. Too much, huh? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I wouldn't think that they would be around here, but... Oh, you can, you can meet... Uh... Uh, on the road. Uh, you could see them on the yes. road. Wow. Do they get hit by cars? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Then does somebody run out and take it and bring it home? <laughs> Wait, the car is broken. Oh, yeah, right. I know. <laughs> we have that at home with the deer and the moose. And the deer, yeah. And the and bear. But deer only in the forest. Mm. Oh. Only in the forest. This is interesting. I'm drinking the apple now. And, um... In the corn. In the corn, a boar. Yeah. Boar in the corn. In the corn, the boar goes into the corn. That's bad news. They rip it up. Yeah. Do you have, um, we eat corn, we take the corn uh, and we boil it with water and have corn on the cob. Do you eat that here in France? Where you just take the corn off the stalk, put it in boiling, you know, you take the, the outside husk. I, in in France, we don't eat uh, corn. It's for the animals. Yes. Oh, okay. A little for human, for people. Right. Yes. A little, just a little. Okay. Not, not like in USA. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. We love corn on the cob. Yeah. Uh -huh.
just so you know, Ciderville, that sausage, that blood sausage that Michel served that evening, seeping in pore that it had been essentially steamed in, was to die for. Yes, it was indeed. And again, that was from the farm, the pigs on the farm where the pore was made. That could be a song, couldn't it? All right, when we return next, we're going to talk a little bit about the trees in Normandy, a little bit more about cider as we kind of wind down my evening with Michel Darjan. Tell people about the trees here and they can't believe it. I, I, I like trees. Yeah. Um, and uh, today, farmers... Cut uh, trees, mm, hedges uh, for uh, agriculture. Huh. Yeah, one of the cider makers that I talked to, he says it's a problem even with the apple trees and pear trees that they cut them down too. It's just like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Many apple trees were um, pulled out. It's interesting for me coming here because I think that this, I hear like the, the cider and the puree, it was like a peasant's drink and people don't really appreciate it like champagne or wine. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I talked to a lot of the cider makers and they seem a little sad, like we're having a really hard time making a living. We could barely keep going, and um, and I look at Normandy and I think, oh my goodness, what a natural resource! It's 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 if it's as good as Champagne, it's as good as Bordeaux. Yes. It's just yes, but uh, it, not appreciated. It has many work for right. made it uh, collecting uh, um, right. fruits and. Um, Preparation, many work for a little um, price. How much does a bottle of pore go for? Three. It's a steal. Be between three and four uh, uh, euros. Oh, wow, um, what a steal! Mm, yeah. I mean, that's you think about how much work goes into mm. getting the pears mm. and making sure everything's mm. clean. I mean, mm. it's not an easy job to make. Perfection. Yes, um, this one is three uh, and a half uh, euros. Mm -hmm. A bottle of cider, you know, like a bottle like this, mm -hmm. from Normandy imported into the U.S. will go for about seventeen dollars. Uh, not not unusual. Mm -hmm. yes. And then American cider in bottles like this, some of them will be that much too. Not unusual. Yeah. It's um, at the same scale because when pe people get that, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to yes. make cider. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very different product. Yeah. It's like wine in that way. And beer is easier to make in terms of getting the, you know, there's somebody who gets all the grain and you just buy it and put it together. Yeah. But um, why cognac? Very cheap, 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 cheap. cheap. Yeah. yeah. Why? Why? Uh, it's not. It's not more difficult to do. No. Uh, to make it. Well said, Michel. Why is it that cognac is easier to get than calvados? And I'm not going to knock cognac. I love a good bottle of cognac, no doubt. But don't you think it's a little bit that people don't realize that it's there? How many folks out there in Ciderville listening right now don't even know that Calvados from the region that Michelle and I were in on that evening is actually made with a primary base of pear versus apple. That's right, that region of France is able to have their own calvados where they make the base pore and then distill it. And that's partly what we're going to be doing on that trip to Normandy. 
uh, looking at the different styles, tasting it because it's a very different Calvados versus up in Pédoge. It's all and has to be all cider apple. I'm just savoring at the mouth, just thinking, about, oh my God, going there again and to be able to like sip the, that cider and to taste the food and to speak to people like Michelle. And I want to say, you know, it's not always that easy to find someone like this. So it's my deep pleasure to be able to share this intimate conversation with you. Next, we're going to have a little chat with the maker of the pore that we were drinking that evening and from the blood sausage and also the chicken, all because of Michel. He met with me the next morning at breakfast and you want to look at some of the photos in the show notes for this episode and showed me a, a topographical map that I took a photo of because that was the only way I was able to find Regis uh, and the and his farm. Otherwise, I wouldn't have. And actually, when I found this maker, the only reason he kind of like gave me the time of day is because I had a photo of Michelle. <laughs> so that's sometimes how it works. And uh, boy, was it time well spent. So we're going to just have a little snippet of that just to give you the craziness of when you're actually in Normandy on your own and you don't have the info there. I mean, it's great if you have a lot of time, but if you're really wanting to spend time and just being savoring it, then you want to uh, maybe think about coming along with me and some amazing folks on the tour to Normandy coming up in September. So let's come right back and go to that chat. Okay, so now I am following the producer in his little green, uh, kind of like a little green van. After I lost my keys, I keep on losing my keys when I'm here. I put them down. I get so excited that I don't remember where they are. He's like peeling out of here, and I'm peeling behind him because, ah, uh, well, I'm sure he knows if there's any trouble up ahead. Um, it's very exciting to to uh, to do something like this when you finally find the little treasure hunt. And maybe that's part of what it is for Normandy, but there's a little bit more than that to uh, discover here. And now we're squishing between a couple vehicles. Here we go. This is the place that we go to. I did not know. We're going down a different road. And it says Le Martinier. Hello? Please leave a message. not available, thanks. Hi, it's Ria. Hello, it's Ria again, and I'm going to be a little bit late getting to your place because I just hunted down a pore maker that I just had to speak to. So I'm a little south in uh, Sosi, or Susi, down. It's the other town, that, the one that we weren't in. <laughs> so it's about 11 o'clock now. I'm probably going to be more there around 12. So if it works out, great. Uh, if not, I'll be checking out the Musée du Cider next door. All right, you got my number. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Wow. Oh, we never thought this is the way to go. Oh, my goodness. Where are we going? We're heading off to the land of the unknown. Wow. Oh, this is the chalet I saw from the top. This guy's got a cook in here. Oh, yeah. Bonjour. No, uh, je ne pas parle français. Ah. Voilà. Ah. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry for my tenue. Uh, uh, I uh, work with uh, uh, Carlos. No. Carlos. Carlos. Calvados? No. No, we Calvados, we in Oui, oui, oui. But golf, golf. Golf. Golfing? Uh, cow. Small cows. Small cows. Small, Small cows. cows, yes. You are the corn. You're doing the corn and the cows. 
Yeah. <laughs> Difficult for me. Oh. It's okay. It's we, okay. We, have, we have a calvados. We, oui, we, oui. and and this eh, poire, 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 so and eh, cidre, and and cidre, cidre, cidre. cidre. Uh, voilà. Il y en a dans la carte. Mm -hmm. Alors, so um, I would like to get two bottles of your poire, two bottles, and a bottle of your calvados. You have two, ten, ten, and ten or and eight. eight. Uh, today. It has 12. Today it's 12. 12. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because uh, uh, etiquette uh, 2016. 2016. Voilà. Okay. Donc uh, today in 2000 and, uh, 2018, 2018. It has 12. Yeah. 12. Old. Perfect. Perfect. You understand? Yes, oh, I do. You, 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 perfect, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Difficult. So, Hello, uh, <coughs> what do you test? I, I, uh, from Michel, I've had the poire. Poire. I've had the aperitif. Sous, sous, yes. Poire. I Pomme. Did, I, I didn't have uh, the uh, calvados. We. Did, um, uh, you have not tested calvados. I have not tested the calvados. So. You test. We. Oui. Yes. Oh. Oof. Oof. Just dur Yeah. It I'm is hot, so weather. I know. And going today to is good. But, uh, yeah, it's a good day. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Hello. Perfect to test. It's okay to take a photo of you. Yes. No problem. Attendez. Okay. Good. Great. Oui. That good. Oui. Alors, you live in United States. Oui, in uh, Massachusetts, where Boston is. Massachusetts. Oui, and Cedar in the U.S. Boom, a very exciting time. Have you seen uh, our apple trees on the at the farm? Uh, big, big apple trees. I was Pommier. driving by on the road, <laughs> yes, and I go, ooh. We have only big trees, not small trees mm -hmm. with uh, pesticides, not pesticides. No, no pesticides. Zero. Right, right. Or Zero pesticides. Right, like organic. Chin. Chin. It's good. It's good. You're, you're very good. Just to back it up a little bit here, Ciderville, this farmer was calving, from what I understand, and I pulled him away from that, and he was so kind to be gracious enough to come out and pour me some Calvados. And then, as we were trying to talk here further in the background, he's actually showing me some photos of a baker that he's connected to in Paris. A lot of his product actually gets sent into Paris, and there's a good reason why. So that's a little bit of the conversation there. And I think it's best to hear it in his words that all the best tables in Paris serve his cider. All the big, uh, the good mm. uh, tab table of mm -hmm. Paris. Mm. Alors, our cider. Wow. <laughs> no surprise. And then we just talk about the fall, this coming fall, September, and essentially me asking permission to bring a tour group to his site. Next fall, next year, this time, next uh, September oui. 2018. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Difficile. I know, I know, I know. Uh, 2018, mm? September, okay. You come in France again? Again, with a group. Are we uh, any people? We. Oui. And can you, I? You, you, like you, you, you come to drink, to degust? Drink and. Degustation? We, oui, we, oui, to oui. coming to France. I would like to bring the group to meet you, to, to taste the the 
for a and cedar. In September uh, 20, uh, 2018. 18, yes, oui. Massachusetts or Ma um, Massachusetts. Attendez. Perfect. Fief, c'est le fief des Kennedy là-bas. Oui. <laughs> Très bon. OK. Alors, septembre. Septembre 2018. Au revoir. He's a busy guy. Oh my goodness. What a wonderful man. That was so worth it. And he's right. He's one of the best. And then I taste it. Peppery, amazing, worth it. Ah, but I did find it with a little bit of help from my friend Michelle. And what an amazing time that was. I've, I've gotten thirsty, so excuse me. I'm going to open this bottle here of this 12-year-old Cavados. It says 10 years old on it, but it's actually 12. And uh, I kind of like this age, actually. And uh, drinking it in a very large mouth. Uh, kind of like a brandy sip, sniffer glass to get the full bouquet. going to just let it simmer there. But for you, I'm going to take this little taste. Uh, there's something so distinct about the Cavados that's made with Poré. It has this a spiciness that's really unique. Ugh. Well, you heard it. We got there, and I got out of there. It was quite the experience because I was really struggling at that point, and uh, <laughs> he was so kind. So we're going to be heading to that producer. His name is Regis and his wife, Sylvie Angat, and uh, stay tuned for that. All right, well... We got a little bit uh, to catch up here on some cider competitions. I want to talk about two, actually three that are happening in May, and we'll go in chronological order. May 5th is the 23rd annual Boston Homebrew Competition in Boston. They are also doing cider and mead. I will be there. Cider Chat is sponsoring this event, and the winning cider maker will be on this here podcast. Looking forward to that. I'm salivating a lot from that cowboy dose. May 16th is the International Cider and Perry event in Herefordshire in the UK. That's going to be, I believe, at the Cider Museum there. So go to the link in the show notes to find the registration if you want to do that. Good luck to everyone out there. You know, kind of interestingly, uh, a couple of years back, the winner of that competition was... In 2003, it was the Boston Beer Company. And at that point, Angry Orchard wasn't even a contender in the market because Angry Orchard came on board in 2012. But back then, Boston Beer Company, which Angry Orchard is under, had another brand called Hardcore Cider. It started in 1997. And I met the cider maker back then, Grant, and they were working with... Uh, Alan Tringham from the UK, who used to work at Bulmers, which is a very large cider maker. So that was two awards uh, back in 2003. An American cidery won, the same one also won in 2017, just last year, Angry Orchard. Pretty cool. But anyways, there's a lot of good UK cider makers. And the other cider competition event is happening May 16th through the 19th. That's a Great Lakes International Cider and Perry competition known as Glint Cap. Both the Boston and uh, Glint Cap event, you have to get your ciders in by April 20th. 420 folks, don't wait because uh, 420 you'll be doing other things.
thanks to all the regular listeners who come back every week to hang out in Ciderville with me. And if you're new to the podcast, well, I hope you enjoy the ride. There's so much happening out in Ciderville. And a big thank you to the Talking Palms. That's the Medlars, Perry Pear, and Mr. Quince. I don't know what I would do without those palms, those Talking Palms in the Cider House. This is Rio Wind Collar. I'm going to be back next week with another episode of Cider Chat. In the meanwhile, you make sure that you keep on loving it out there. Because before you know it, I'll be seeing you in Ciderville. Yeehaw!